In this video, we'll consider classification of an arrangement as a partnership and we'll go through a problem. Let's read the problem together. Avocado and banana, two individuals, purchase unimproved land as co-tenants. In each of the following independent alternatives, determine whether avocado and banana have created an entity for federal tax purposes. So here are the three different alternatives. They hold the land for appreciation. They lease the land to Coconut, who uses the land for growing fruit, and they construct a fruit-themed hotel on the land and hire dragon fruit to manage the hotel for them. Now remember, these three are independent alternatives, so they're separate. They're, they're not all three together. They're separate instances. All right. Before we actually go through and determine if this is an entity, as the question is asking, let's talk about classification of an arrangement as a partnership. I have a video that goes through a four-step process, a four-step process, and if you have yet to watch that video, please stop and watch that video first. Once you go through that video, let's just review. So the first step is we're going to determine, do we have an arrangement? Do we have an arrangement that rises to the level of an entity? Do we have an arrangement that rises to the level of entity? If we do, we continue. If we do not, we stop. We do not have an entity. Okay, so that's what this problem is focusing on. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to go into this. So if you recall from that video, to determine if an arrangement rises to the level of an entity, we have to look at a few factors. Now before we consider that, I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about first, why it even makes a difference. And second, what exactly do I mean by an arrangement as an entity? Because some of you might be thinking, well, I thought if you're an entity for state law purposes, right, if you're a corporation for state law purposes or a partnership for state law purposes, that's what you are for federal tax purposes. And generally speaking, that is the case, but it's not that clear. So let's actually do the second of those two items first. And that is, when it comes to the federal tax law, in the federal tax law, in code section 761, it defines what a partnership is. Because recall, subchapter K of the Intro Revenue Code, which is the 700s, that deals with partnership taxation. So partnership is defined broadly in the tax law. It's not just, oh, you have to be a, a partnership for state law purposes to be a partnership for federal law purposes or an LLC for state law purposes to be considered a partnership for federal purposes. It's even broader than that. It can be a joint venture between some parties, a syndicate, something more broader than just an entity for state law purposes. So the idea here is you might have some type of contractual relationship contractual relationship between parties and that contractual relationship may rise to the level of a federal tax entity even though it's not a state law entity which remember state laws controls when it comes to general liability purposes so maybe you own um, a house or a building as tenants in common or joint tenancy with somebody else and it's through a contract but you did not form an entity with that person well, you may have a, a, a partnership or an entity for federal tax purposes, even though you don't have one for state law purposes. That's the issue here. So that's the first thing I want to talk about. The second thing is, why does this even matter? The reason why this matters is because if you think about it, if, there, if we're not going to be an entity, if we're not an entity, then it's going to flow through to as a disregarded entity disregard in the sense that it doesn't even exist flow through as a disregarded so if you're an individual if you're an individual owner and you normally file form 1040 right 1040 then it just would go on let's say it's a business activity then it would just go on your schedule c on the 1040 and it would just flow on as a disregarded entity if you are uh, a corporation, it would just go on your Form 1120, even though this is this is not your normal activities. Maybe you're doing this as a joint venture of another corporation, okay? But if it is an entity, if you do have an entity, then you have to file whatever that form is. So if this entity um, is treated as um, a, ten, uh, a partnership, you have to file a Form 1065 with respect to the arrangement. If it's a corporation, 1120. If it's a S corporation, 1120S. 
Okay, you have to file a specific. What, so you might be saying, okay, well, won't the tax implications still be the same other than having to file a, a, you know, a form and, a, and go by all those rules? Not necessarily, or usually the case is no. The reason why is because let's say you end up becoming treated as an entity and you're a partnership and you file form 1065. Well, in later videos dealing with partnership tax, you're going to learn the partnership has to have their own me method of accounting as well as their own year um, year end. And that could be different than the owners of the partnership, which if you are not treated as not an entity, you just use your method of accounting and your year end as you normally would as an individual in that case. So that makes a big difference. Your year end, your method of accounting, I always call it the MOA. And also things like certain elections. Like if you want to elect um, section 1033 involuntary conversion, normally if, or if you're not an entity, each owner would elect that treatment. It could be treated differently depending on the owners. If you're not an entity, the arrangement, right? This contractual relationship that's treated as an arrangement. But if it's an entity, the entity makes the election and boom, guess what? It flows over to those owners. So it makes a big difference. So any elections, guess what? The entity, and there's other things out there, but the entity makes that difference and that's going to be treated for all the owners rather, or versus if it's not an entity, owners can do things differently. So that's kind of the, that's the main difference with, between being an entity versus non-entity other than obviously having to file a form. So again, step one, we go through arrangement. If we're treated and we determine, are we an entity or not? And the idea here is with, with these kinds of issues, if you have some type of contractual relationship where you're not an entity for state law purposes, but you might be considered a, an entity for federal tax purposes, because if you're a, if you are a partnership, a general partnership, limited partnership, limited liability partnership, uh, a limited liability company for state law purposes, the default rule, unless you want to get out of that is, and that's what these four step processes do in the video is you're going to be treated as a partnership for tax purposes, a federal tax entity, a uh, as a partnership. If you're a corporation for state law purposes, guess what? You're treated as a, a corporation. Okay. So keep that in mind. Now, before I finish with the steps, we're going to actually get to the root of this problem, what this problem is dealing with, okay? To determine whether an arrangement, right? Let's take this contractual relationship. Let's say Avocado and Banana, they enter into a contract, and they're going to purchase unimproved land as co-tenants. So they're doing this through a contract. They have not formed an entity under state law, okay? And the question is, are we an entity for federal tax purposes? After the discussion, now you understand why it makes a difference. So... In determining when an arrangement rises to the level of entity, there's an important case. There's an important, important Supreme, Court case, Supreme Court case called Culbertson. And in that case, this determined the main, there was many issues, but the main thing is it, it determined when an uh, arrangement rose to the level of an entity for purposes of being a partnership. Or, and this can be applied across the board. So in Culbertson, the court focused really on two things. Do the parties have a profit motive? Do they have a motive to actually generate profit? Or are they going to share profits? Okay? So the idea here is if you're just simply doing this to share expenses, like maybe two accountants get together and, or two lawyers get together and they're going to share some office space, but they're going to operate their businesses separately and they're not going to you know, um, have like a share of, of their profits together. They're just doing this simply to share expenses. Well, guess what? That's not going to rise to the level of an entity if it's, unless it's treated, unless they actually treat it as an entity under state law. So simply sharing expenses is not enough. You have to have a profit motive, sharing a profit some way. And you also need to rise to the level of certain activity. Certain activity. Of course, this one is going to be a facts and circumstances. But the way I like to think about this is... You might recall in some of my previous videos, I talked about trader business versus investment. And there was a case out there called Grotzinger. There's a whole line of uh, Supreme Court jurisprudence, case law jurisprudence, dealing with what is considered a trader business. And to be considered a trader business, an activity, a business has, has to, or the activity of the taxpayer has to be both continuous and regular. That's a key element. So when the court is focusing on the certain activity from the Culbertson, it's similar to, it's not exactly identical. 
It's similar to the idea of Grotzinger, the Supreme Court and Grotzinger, where they were determining trader business. And one of the key aspects of the activity, other than a uh, profit motive as well, was that the activity has to be continuous and regular, okay, in nature. Okay, it has, and again, it's not purely the same as that, but we're looking at the activity. Is there a certain activity that's continuous and regular? Um, are we also, is there a certain activity that seems more like it be in line with having um, some type of arrangement that would be treated like an entity? That's the idea. Okay, so now that we've gone through that, what I want to do now is I want to look at our facts and I want to focus on the three alternatives. We're going to call them alternative A, B, and C. And this problem actually, yes, there's three different alternatives, but after you understand what's going on so far, the best way to do this, the best way for me to teach you this is to look at it in the sense of a, a continuum, okay? Let's draw out a continuum here, all right? On the left side, we're going to call this um, the arrangement rises to the level of entity. On the right side, this, this is going to be not an entity, not an entity. So question we're, the question we're addressing is a contractual relationship here, again, between avocado and banana. Does that arrangement, we call it an arrangement, right? Arrangement, does that rise to the level of a federal tax entity, which again makes a big difference because of these special rules like year end, method of accounting, and having to elect for all the owners the same. Okay, so on this continuum, again, on the left, we have the entity, meaning it will be treated as an entity. On the right, not an entity. Okay, and again, remember we're focusing on profit motive, sharing profits, and also certain activity rising level because it's not just profit motive. You need also certain types of activities, and it's kind of similar to the continuous and regular of trader business. So that's how all this fits together. That's how all this fits together. With that, Let's go through situations A, B, and C and view them all together. Okay, let's just read all, all three again and then we'll consider them and then we'll put them kind of on our continuum because you're going to see some of them. Obviously, it's a little bit easier. Okay, so again, avocado banana, two individuals purchase unimproved land as co-tenants. And each of the following independent alternatives, we're determining again, the question is, is this a federal entity? Just to remind you what the question, what we're dealing with here. Talked about high level, now we're, now we're jumping right in. So the first situation, I'm going to read all three. First situation, A, they hold the land for appreciation. Well, appreciation suggests profit motive, right? There's a profit motive. I'm going to denote pi as the profit motive. The second one, they lease the land to coconut who uses the land for growing fruit. They lease. Again, we've got a profit motive. And the third one, they construct a fruit-themed hotel on the land right? This is unimproved land and hire dragon fruit to manage the hotel for them. Well, there's a hotel here. So again, there's an intent in all three of these. We can reasonably assume there's a profit motive. They're doing these, these type, they're going into purchasing the, the land, unimproved land as co-tenants because they want to generate profit. They're not doing this to share expenses. Like maybe avocado and banana might be um, using the land for um, storing as a warehouse because they're both retailers and they need the land to store. I don't know. Uh, maybe they sell um, boats and they need the land to store boats on because they need to put it somewhere. Okay. Um, probably a bad example, but you get the idea. They're not simply sharing expenses. They're, they're either banking on appreciation and A, leasing land to somebody else, um, and B, and then C, they're going into a hotel business or hotel activity, I should say. And all three of these, we got the profit motive. So boom, we've got profit motive. Okay. So going to our continuum, we're never going to be on the right side in all three of these on not an entity, right? We're, they're, they're, I mean, uh, I mean, in terms of being an absolute, right? This is a hundred percent. This is this is saying a hundred percent not an entity. If you're if you're immediately on the right side, there's a hundred percent chance you are not an entity. On the left side, you're saying you're hundred percent that you are an entity. The second issue, again, this is a facts and circumstances, and we have to address this. You have to kind of think about this. I know it's tough. And if you're taking one of my courses, whether it's a, a law course or um, accounting uh, partnership course, whatever it is, or you're taking some other professor, there again, there's no there's no 100% answer to this unless, again, the only thing we know 100% is that if you're simply sharing expenses, that will not be an entity. That is clear from the law. That's 100% not the case. And that would be over here on the edge of not an entity. But we don't have that. We do not have that case. Okay? So let's go, all, go through all three of these. So in A... They hold land for appreciation. B, 
They lease the land to Coconut, who's, who uses the land for growing fruit, and C, they construct a fruit-themed hotel on the land to hire dragon fruit to manage the hotel for them. So think about the level of activity that avocado and banana, they, that it's involved, and, and having to, to, to plan out and organize the business and, and what's going on, you know, having a business plan, all this stuff. So I purposely created this problem to focus on the facts and circumstances. And I purposely also did this so that the more you go down, the closer on the continuum you're going to be towards an entity. Okay? So I'm going ahead. I'm telling you that. But I'm going to explain. So I'm giving you kind of the answer in a way. So as we go A, B, and C, you're going to, you're going to see that we're going to be going closer and closer to entity. But again, it's not going to be 100% the case. I mean, you probably would need more facts. You need to know, you know, what look at cases, similar cases, and whatnot. But as we go, we're going to get closer and closer to entity. So think about the first one. So they're buying land, and all they're doing is going to hold land for appreciation. So if you were buying land just to bank on it going up in value, land banking, and you plan on it just going up in value, and then you're going to sell it down the road, how much activity goes into that? Right? Maybe you pay property taxes you know, every year. Um, you might have to upkeep the property you know, once a year, depending on what kind of land it is. Maybe you have to trim the grass because you know, it might have some type of ordinance issue. But the idea here is it's pretty much low or minimal activity. So for this one, we're going to put it, and again, don't think of this as like, oh yeah, we're exactly in the middle. We're just going to put this closer, not, not too close, but closer to the side of not an entity. And the reason I'm putting it here, I'm putting it right here, is because we do have a profit motive. Again, there's a big difference between just sharing expenses and having profit. Okay, if you're banking on appreciation, both avocado and banana, if they're selling it for a gain, they're both going to share that gain. Okay, there's no doubt about that. They're going to share. We don't know how. Uh, maybe they're 50 50s uh, owners. We don't know. But the main point is that guess what? In A, we're, there's, min there's not much activity, right? The certain activity. Um, this could be seen more like an investment. Think about it like that. And it might not rise to the level of entity. Again, it's different from business or investment. But think about it if that helps you in that mindset. So let's now go to B. So I put it right here, okay? about one third from the edge of not the entity. Okay, B, they lease the land to Coconut who uses the land for growing fruit. Okay, so in this one, they've actually had to go out, find a, a tenant, find a party that's going to rent the land, lease the land from them, and then Coconut goes out and grows fruit on the land. So the land is actually being used for business for Coconut, for avocado and banana, though, they're going out. They have a relationship. I mean, they might have they, – they very likely have um, – they have requirements. They have to fulfill in the contract with respect to the land. There's probably certain things, you know, they probably cannot bother uh, coconut. They can't just drive on the land without, you know, coconut's permission. They can't let other people – you know, there, there's certain rights. Think about property as a bundle of sticks, Right. Um, when avocado and banana, when they purchase this land, they control this bundle of sticks. Okay, the bundle of sticks. Here's our little, here's our sticks. Okay, and when you lease property, some of those sticks either are completely removed while the lease is taking place or they're limited. That's the idea. There might be some, or there are some that avocado and banana still control, like, okay, in the end, it's still our property, but some of those, those, that bundle, of, some of those sticks have been kind of severed. That's how we that's how we think of when we think of property and law. Well, the idea here is we're getting closer to an entity because there there's certain activity that comes with leasing property that just appreciation and value. So for this one, I'm going to put it. Um, Let's say, I mean, again, this could be a function of how, how active the lease is or how involved they are, all that good stuff. You know, what actually it could be a, a serious amount of land and a serious, you know, um, undertaking and all that stuff. But let's just, let's just keep it simple. Let's say it's a simple plot of land, you know, maybe an acre or two. Um, you know, there's, there's not like, like an advanced level, but a normal level of activity going on here. I'm going to say um, maybe 40% not an entity. Okay, 40%. So right here. Okay, C. They construct a fruit-themed hotel on the land and hire dragon fruit to manage the hotel for them. Okay, so think about this. A, a hotel. So you got you got different rooms being being uh, rented out or you know used by uh, daily by or weekly or whatever it is monthly by guests. You got you know uh, employees. You're pro you're gonna have to um, hire. I mean 
Dragon Fruit is managing it. Dragon Fruit obviously is doing this. You're paying Dragon Fruit fruit probably a salary or you know dragon fruits probably act very actively involved you have to pay someone now to get involved this could be extremely you know depending on the level this could be very 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 highly 99.99 percent entity again i'm not going to say 100 percent because it's facts and circumstances we don't know again this is more information but the idea here is as as we're going a b and c we're getting closer to entity i would say this one let's let's say um 70 percent uh or 30 percent from entity you know we're over here so as you saw, we went closer and closer to entity, right? We start off A, holding banking on appreciation. Then B, we rent it out, leased it out. And maybe we'll say that one because it's just, it's simply also just growing fruit, you know, have, making the land available to grow fruit. It's not like you're, you're leasing uh, a building to somebody. That, that might be a little bit more involved because you might be required to maintain it. And, you know, um, oh, someone breaks a window, you got to maintain, change the window, all that good stuff. It's just simply just land and you're just making it available for them. They're planting the seeds, they're harvesting, they're doing all the, all the, most of the work, the, the party coconut is. And C, now we're actually getting kind of into that level where, hey, look, um, avocado, banana, they're actually, they have to be involved or at least thinking the business plan of this hotel. It's a fruit themed hotel. They went through that business plan, they thought about that, boom right? They got that. So we're closer and closer to entity. Again, if you have any type of question like this in your, in your class, then it's probably meant to be more of like an essay. You're thinking about these things. You're writing them out. The key is, again, understanding how the steps, how it makes a difference. Uh, section 761, the partnership joint venture, why it makes a difference, you know, the Culbertson decision, all that good stuff. So that's really what I'm going to do with that. I do want to finish the video talking about the steps in the process. So again, step one, we determine, hey, this relationship between avocado and banana, is this arrangement, right, contractual relationship, we're calling an arrangement, is it an entity? Let's say we're C, right, the closest to entity. So we are an entity. If we're not an entity, let's say we're A and B and maybe we, we view it, it's not an entity. If it's not an entity, again, we go right here. And if they're individuals, which they are, right, they're two individuals, guess what? The activity, the profits from like the gain from um, their, their, the holding of land, if it's investment, Maybe they're in the business of this. It might be Schedule C and flows their Schedule C. If it's investment, it's probably going to go on to the you know, capital gain, capital loss statement for them. Um, same thing would be renting or leasing. Maybe it goes on Schedule E for rental. Maybe if they're in the business of renting, it goes on Schedule C, right? Makes a big difference there. Okay, so that would, that was, that's what happens if it was not considered an entity. It would just flow through on their 1040, the schedule, depending on whether it's a business activity, investment, capital asset, boom, all that good stuff. What if it is an entity? So C, let's take C. It is an entity. Okay, if it's an entity, we continue on to step two. So step two is we distinguish trusts. So we say, okay, we do we have a trust? A trust type activity. Okay, we don't have a trust type activity here. And that one's a little bit more involved. I'm not really, I don't really go too much into that. If you watch my video, the four-step process, you know that I didn't really go too much into distinguishing a trust. But the idea here is, okay, this is not a trust, a trust type activity where we have some type of, you know, you're um, putting property into a, uh, an arrangement for, you know, holding it for maybe when someone attains a certain age or whatnot. This is not a trust. So we're distinguishing um, trust from... If we're not a trust, we are considered a business entity because an entity technically under the tax law is, a trust is considered an entity. It files a form 1041 separate, but we're, we are a business entity. So yes, we are a business entity. So then we go to step three. If we were a trust, we'd stop there and we apply the trust rules, but we're not. So we're a business entity. So step three is then we say, okay, well, are you a per se under the law corporation? And the way we look at that is we look at state law, we look at international law if you're focusing on other countries, and if you are a corporation under state law, per se corporation, right, you file to be a corporation, you are treated as a corporation for tax purposes. Now, you might be a C corporation or S corporation depending on, you know, if you meet certain criteria, but you will be a corporation. The idea there is you cannot be a partnership, okay? You cannot be a partnership. It's not going to be possible. Okay, so if you are a per se corporation, you stop, you're treated as a corporation, then you have to ask, are you going to be a C corporation, S corporation, all that good stuff, if you can meet S corporation, or if you even want, want to be S corporation, if you can. File form 2553, boom, all that good stuff. Okay, let's say we're not a corporation, right? Because remember, we didn't file anything with the, with the, with the state. We're just a, a contractual relationship. Okay, well, then you go to step four. Step four is then you get, you get to elect your treatment. And the idea here is 
the default rules, if you have one owner, you are treated as, let me zoom out here. If you have one owner, you can be treated as uh, one of two different things. You can be either a disregarded entity, if you have one owner, okay, disregarded entity, or you can be treated as a corporation, okay? If you have two or more owners, then the rules are you'll either be treated as a partnership under the tax law and uh, subchapter K, right, the 700 applies, or you could be a corporation. Now, here's the key, is that if you do not elect, okay, then the default is the what Congress and the IRS and Treasury, they specifically said, okay, well, if you don't elect, we're going to give you the, the one level of tax rather than the double tax and the corporation. You'll be treated as either disregarded if you were one owner or partnership. But if you do want to be treated as a corporation, which I'll explain why sometimes that happens, then you have to elect to be treated as a corporation and you have to check the box, okay? You have to check the box and the form is form 8832. Okay, and um, you check the box to be treated as a corporation. Now, if again, if you want the default, generally speaking, you do not have to um, to actually check the box for that, and you can just go ahead and leave off that form. But if you do want to be treated as a corporation, file form eight eight three two, elect, check the box. That's what we call it, checking the box. Um, that you want to be treated as a corporation. And the reason why a lot of entities will do that is maybe they're an LLC for state law purposes and then they're a, they want to be treated as an S corporation for federal purposes because there are advantages. Advantages. Please see my uh, choice of entity, business entity playing video on where I go over you know the differences between um, the, some of the tax advantages of being an S corp over um, an LLC. And the idea there is S corps at the time of this video, and this might change in the future, have some uh, self have some employment tax benefits over LLC. But you might want to be an LLC for state purposes because it might give you some advantages over being a corporation. And that's the idea. That's how we go about all this good stuff. So boom, we've gone through all four steps. I've showed you how this arrangement idea, right? We focused on this step here, but once you get past um, step one, I mean, we're not going to focus on distinguishing a trust. Step three is pretty straightforward. I mean, if you get into that international area where you have to determine, hey, in this country, you know, in Germany, like this is the equivalent of a of a corporation, whatever they whatever they call it. Um, you can go into the regs, you can see it, and um, and you get to step four, you get to elect. If you don't elect, you're treated as the default, which is disregarded if you're one owner, partnership of two or more. Okay. If you're disregarded, then you basically apply the same rules as we saw above, right? It just flows through to the owners as that, that case. You just go on your Schedule C or Schedule E if it's rental, whatever it is. Now, one thing I want to leave you with, I mentioned the regulations. I mentioned a few code sections, right? Section 761. The regulations that are important here are all found in Reg 301. Yes, the procedural regs, point seventy seven zero one dash one dash two dash three. And that's where you find the check the box regs. The check the box, that's the most important one. That's where you can elect. You actually find that in the regs. So if you actually do have that issue in practice, look towards those regs. You can also find some of those foreign entities that I mentioned. And um, I, I believe it's reg 301.7701-2. Um, but it might, you might have to look elsewhere as well. But that's usually where you find it. Okay, so I hope you've enjoyed this video. Again, this show, this problem goes through a, a simple example, but it also is comprehensive in how everything fits together. And really, if you're taking a, a partnership tax class in accounting school, law school, my class, this is basically what the teacher most likely wants you to understand how it, how it works, how it fits together, why it makes a difference to be a partnership versus not, you know, be an entity versus not an entity, like filing for a partnership versus being a, a disregarded entity, and then the four-step process. Again, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please, my, please watch my other partnership videos as well as my other tax videos.